This is the Thoughtfully Made Fiber broadcast. I'm your host, Amy Sher, and today we're going to be talking all about buying your first spinning wheel. Buying your first spinning wheel can be super intimidating because they're very room intensive to store. You might not have room for more than one, and they can get really expensive. Spinning wheels can range anywhere from free to $2,000 to $3,000 for a single spinning wheel. And if you're a new spinner, chances are you haven't had a chance to try a lot of them yet. So I thought I would put together some of the things that I wish I knew before I bought my first spinning wheel. Let's get right into it. First of all, if you at all can, please look up fiber festivals or spinning wheel shops in your area. If you have a particular brand in mind, you can look at the stockists of that brand on their website and look for spinning wheels in your area to try. Now, I purchased my first wheel in 2020 and that was obviously not an option for me. Nothing was open and there were no festivals. So um, this, this advice that everybody was giving me was pretty much useless because I was at home spinning on a truck spindle for days and not making much progress because it takes so long and I was so impatient and I wanted to spin larger quantities <clears throat> and I very much wanted a wheel and I couldn't try one out. Uh, nor could I join a guild, which would be my other suggestion. Uh, many metro areas have a either a spinning or weaving guild and whichever one they have, they typically have a lot of like fiber equipment tasting. So you can always email them and ask when the next one is. Join a guild, learn more. The classes and presentations are typically great. Um, they always have been. Uh, when I look at the program over in the Los Angeles, greater, uh, the Greater Los Angeles Fiber Guild that I um, used to kind of sort of like be tend adjacent to, I was never part of it because I moved before I really got into it. And now I'm part of the, um, the I think it's called the St. Louis Weavers Guild and it's one of the oldest guilds and they have great presentations and materials and resources. So if you can get to a guild or a fiber festival or a store to try out a spinning wheel, any spinning wheel, that'll give you a lot of information. And you, you'll, you know, I'm so sorry to say this, but before I bought my first spinning wheel, I thought that my first spinning wheel would be my last, that I would buy one spinning wheel and I'll just learn to love it and that'll be my last spinning wheel and I'll never need to buy another one again. That was just not the case. Um, I would very much like it to be the case. But once I've done a few hundred hours on a spinning wheel, I started to understand more about what I want and how to optimize for my comfort. And especially if you are someone with chronic pain or any kind of repetitive stress injury issues, you're gonna find out things about yourself. <laughs> Um, so I want to go into some of the things that I very much needed to find out that I did not know before my first wheel. So before my first wheel, I had only spun on a drop spindle and I liked it, but I was not able to get as much control as I wanted as a beginner. And I was not able to spin in any kind of volume. And having only one drop spindle meant that I was constantly winding off like a half hank or even like a quarter hank of yarn. Like whenever my drop spindle would get full, I would have to wind it up, spin another full one, ply another full one, tie that onto the previous one, and it took me forever to get like a three ounce skin. So the first piece of advice I always see that I agree with is that you should always try as many wheels as you can. If you can rent a wheel from a local guild or borrow from a friend and get quite a few hours on it, you'll find out a lot of information about the way that you like to spin. Most people who are buying their very first wheel are kind of in the position I was, where you've been drop spindling for ages and ages and you're now hitting a wall, like a skills and equipment wall, and you have no idea what you actually need. And when I bought my wheel, it was in late 2020 and I had been looking for over a year but of course for all of 2020 everything was closed so I had no way of trying a wheel and I bought an old Ashford traditional 
which it then took me hundreds of hours of spinning on it to kind of finesse my technique and begin to understand what kind of spinning I like to do best and also understand the patterns of what what kinds of yarn I wanted to spin in the technique and the positioning that I wanted to spin in. So um, to be, begin with, I wanted to let you know that a few options for where you could try out wheel. If you're interested in a particular brand or the look of a particular brand, you can go on their website and find their stockists and look for one that's close by to you or it's already somewhere that you were going to visit and just try to visit a store to try out their wheels. The other thing is fiber conventions and uh, festivals will often have uh, vendors with wheels to try. Um, it's not ideal. These options are not ideal because you won't be able to try it for a long time, but you at least get a feel for it. Uh, take some lessons from a teacher who can provide a wheel, bring one to you or you can visit them. Uh, there's private teachers in both cities. Um, and to find them, I would look at your local fiber guild. Some of them are specifically spinning guilds and some of them are weaving guilds, but typically the weaving or spinning guilds I have seen cover kind of both, like all fiber arts. So definitely find, gonna find a friend, try to make some friends. This is very difficult for me, but the person I bought it from, Laura, is super lovely and she has she was actually part of the greater los angeles fiber guild and she actually had rescued the wheel that i bought from her at a garage sale for ten dollars and she sold it she fixed it up oiled it up um got it some parts so that it was a functioning wheel with a couple of bobbins and then sold it to me for fifty dollars which i think was a screaming deal um and if you live like along the East Coast, I hear that there's lots of Ashford traditionals like this floating around for $50 to $100. So if you can find an affordable wheel for under $100 to try or borrow one or rent one, uh, any of those options so you can get a few hundred hours in and really get to know the wheel and get to know what you need, that would be optimal. So a few things before, so if, you're not able to try out a wheel and you have no access and you like me live in a fiber arts desert where there's not that many festivals that often and there's even when I go to a festival there's not that many wheels to try here just because there's not enough vendors like say if I went to Rhinebeck there might be like a Kromsky vendor an Ashford vendor a shot vendor and I could try out wheels from all of them and since I am shopping now for my third wheel if I buy one at all, probably not. But if I was shopping for my third wheel, I would need to try out all these different brands. So if you're not able to try out wheels as I wasn't able to, here's a few tips for how to purchase your very first wheel without having tried one at all. Personally, to me, the most important feature and the most important aspect is what kind of traveling that you would want. Um, personally, I wanted a traditional wheel with treadling uh, even though I have chronic pain, the options were kind of like the, the the ones with a big traditional wheel and traveling or an electric wheel. And well, I knew that I wanted to start on a traditional wheel first, but if you have a lot of chronic pain or you don't have mobility or you can't sit for long periods very comfortably and you would like to um, spin kind of half laying back or standing, then you can look into electric wheels. And for the treadles, uh, for the longest time, I didn't know the difference between single and double treadle. And the Ashford Traditional only has one treadle and it's very expensive to convert to, to a tr two treadle set up system. The Ashford Traditional only has, uh, the Ashford Traditional, which was my first wheel, only has one treadle um, that you can treadle with either foot. But I find that as a right-handed person, my left foot wasn't as mobile and fully in control as my right foot and I can only treadle on my right foot. I'm sure you can train yourself to treadle on the left foot as well but it was not comfortable for me or fun and I ended up with a lot of repetitive pain because I do I've twisted my right ankle quite often in my past life so um like my past life in the performance arts so only having the right foot available to me to treadle meant that i was experiencing a lot of pain in my ankle from treadling long hours if so if you have any kind of chronic pain or repetitive stress injury proneness 
I would at minimum get a double treadle, maybe even an electric wheel, just to avoid that problem. And when it comes to treadles, the other thing to pay attention to is how far apart your legs sit. So if you're just sitting, kind of like at a computer and you pretend to treadle, where do your feet land? How far away are they? If you buy one of those travel wheels, like say a shock sidekick or anything that's double treadled and it's tiny itty bitty and the treadles are placed very close together, there's advantages to that because of course it folds up and travels very well. My wheel, the Kronosky Symphony, is not. It's huge. It does not fit into the backseat of my car. Um, but it's more comfortable for me to spin on because when I sit, I naturally have a pretty wide girth between my legs. So that's the other thing to consider is, are you comfortably treadling with the wheels right next to each other? Or would you like there to be a little bit more spacing? Um, and then weigh that against the overall size, aesthetics and performance of the wheel. Um, that's a big factor to take into consideration. The second thing I would take into consideration if I was shopping for a wheel and I didn't, I've never tried a wheel before is the cost of accessories. Now, when I bought my first wheel, it seemed like a super good deal. I was getting a fully functioning wheel for $50 and that was still a great deal. And I could, you know, go home get some fiber and immediately start spinning on it for $50. Now that's an amazing deal. However, my first wheel was a 1970s Ashford Traditional. And if you have an Ashford Traditional or you're looking at Ashford Traditionals, you can date the wheel by the way that the wood was turned. And mine has the little flame maidens, uh, I'm a mother of all, so um, that one places it in like the late 60s, 70s-ish. So because my wheel is so old, some of the parts are old. <laughs> They're just not up to date. And all of Ashford Traditional's uh, accessories are more or less backwards compatible with modifications if necessary. So to update it to a modern wheel with different drive speeds, I paid over $100 for a new flyer, which didn't work super well. It is backwards compatible, but I can't use the last speed, the fastest speed very comfortably, which kind of defeats the point of having it. Um, the final speed, the wheel does not line up with the whorl on that, and I just need to drill the hole in the mother ball for the sliding part more so that I can get it to line up, and I just don't want to make a permanent modification like that. I'm not a handy person, and I don't want to do that. And to buy a... So that, in addition to buying a Lazy Kate, in addition to buying a nitty naughty to wind off my yarn. All of this equipment eventually really added up. And in the end, my $50 wheel ended up much closer to $250. So while I got away with it because the base wheel was very affordable, just $50, um, I got away with the whole setup with extra bobbins, a new flyer, a lazy K, all for $250, almost $300. If you were paying $200, $300 to begin with for the base wheel, now you're getting up into that $500 range and it can be very expensive. And you're getting into that range where you could almost buy a new wheel, at least part of one. Uh, so just be careful of the accessories. Uh, look to see, look online to see the accessibility and the availability and cost of accessories before you purchase the wheel. That way, you kind of know upfront what your costs are. And then when I ended up buying my second wheel, it came with a Lazy Kate. So now I have two Lazy Kates and I didn't need to, but many new wheels will come with a second one. So if you're here buying equipment for your first wheel that's not a complete package, then you end up with a lot of loose equipment laying around and extra bobbins for a brand you might not stick with. So that can be a little bit challenging storage wise. For me, it is because I ended up going with Kromsky for my second wheel. I ended up more in the Kromsky accessory situation because most brands will have cross compatible bobbins like the Kromsky bobbins are compatible across the entire range. And even with Kromsky, I find that the claim is that you can fit four ounces of fiber onto a bobbin, but I have not once been able to pack that much onto a bobbin using double drive, which I'll get into in a second. 
Um, so I needed far more bar bobbins than I initially anticipated and that was an additional cost I had not taken into consideration. So to spend anything larger like a shawl or a sweater, I ended up needing way more bobbin space than I previously thought based on the listing of up to four ounces. So take a look at the total number of accessories that you would need to spin the kind of yarns that you would like. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because um, to spin the kind of projects I want, which are two, three, even five skein projects so far, um, I do need a lazy cake and lots of bobbins at least six and I've also ended up started using a jumbo flyer so that I could apply a huge long skein onto it uh, or a huge long single yarn onto it. Um, so lazy cake can cost anywhere from like making it out of a shoe box which is not ideal because it kind of falls apart or up to like a hundred dollars for a lazy cake. Um, bobbins cost anywhere from $20 to $50, depending on who's making it. So for the bobbins, um, take a look at how much the that brand's bobbins cost, figure in how many bobbins you need. Do they even make that bobbin still? Because sometimes I see a lot of wheels for sale where the bobbins, that, that company is no longer, you know, it's no longer functional. So like if you buy a Reeves wheel, as opposed to a Reeves wheel that's been made by Shocked, which they still maintain and make bobbins for, for a Reeves wheel, which are great wheels, I would get one in a heartbeat if I saw one uh, for a reasonable price, <clears throat> a Reeves wheel to get more bobbins, you would have to send the bobbin into like a custom woodworker and get them to replicate it. And that's just more trouble than I wanna get into. So in many cases, you won't be able to get the accessories that you need or it'll be too costly. So definitely factor those things when you shop for a wheel. So the final thing I wanna go over is the style of spinning that you would like to do. So when I first started spinning, I had a strong preference towards wool and spun yarns which is very difficult, if not impossible, to achieve on drop spindle. I'm sure more experienced spinners than me can achieve it, but I could not. So I very much wanted a wheel just so I could do a nice long draw. Now there are, of course, spindle options for those who want to spin long draw. Um, I've been playing with supported spindles for that reason, but for a wheel, I very much wanted to have access to that style of spinning. Now, if you're spinning worsted spun and you're just doing this short little forward draws, then having your orifice to the left of the wheel um, on a Saxon, Saxony wheel such as mine can be quite cumbersome because then you're doing this, like you're, you're feeding to your left and that's not very symmetrical and you'll end up with a lot of back pain. Now, in comparison to that, when I long draw, I feed like this and with my left hand all the way back here. So it's more comfortable for um, the orifice to be closer to where my hand's gonna be. Like my hand is all the way back there and I could get really far. Uh, so for me, the long draw style makes sense. I like to spin kind of like a semi worsted or semi woolen spun with lots of twists through my fingers and drawing backwards really far. Uh, no matter what kind of, <laughs> really bad, no matter what kind of fiber I'm spinning, I have to work really hard to spin worsted with like fully like forward draw. That's very difficult for me, pain wise. So I don't do it very often at all. And if I could get away with trying backwards to draw, um, that's what I do. So, um, whether you want a Saxony style or a castle style, that's gonna be a big determining factor for what kind of wheel you wanna get. And typically I see both wheels in price ranges that are huge. The next thing to take into consideration is, do you need to travel with this wheel? Will you be taking classes with it? Will you be going to five festivals, demonstrations, or traveling or camping with it? I did not anticipate ever needing to travel with mine, but I actually want to quite a bit. So that means now I'm out of luck because it's very difficult to fit my Kromsky Symphony into a car without 
breaking it. The last time I did, I put it in the trunk and then there was a little chip during travel. And now when I spin it, sometimes my hand catches on the chip and gets a splinter. And now I need to repair it. It's a whole thing. It's very difficult. So if you need to travel, I would look into a castle style wheel, such as the Kiwi or um, the Ashford Kiwi or the Kromsky Sonata, or even a electric wheel like the Hansen or the uh, Dreaming Robots wheels or the Daedalus wheels. Those are all great electric options. One of the disadvantages of travel wheels that are not electric um, with the castle style, which is like when the wheel is centered and then the orifice, the part where you feed the yarn into and the bobbin and everything is above it and everything is up and down straight. Um, one of the limitations of that is that <clears throat> the very largest castle style wheels that I've seen tend to have a smaller wheel diameter than the biggest Saxony style wheels that I've seen. And this is a big factor for me. The bigger the wheel diameter, the more turns, the faster that you can get it to spin. So the bigger the range of speed that you get. <clears throat> so my Kromsky Symphony is a big old 24 inch and I can clearly feel the jump when I spin on a Kromsky Sonata, which has a smaller wheel, um, a smaller diameter versus the Symphony. There's a huge speed jump. And at first, you won't really utilize the full speed range as you're learning on a wheel um, of a full 24 incher like this. And there are wheels that come bigger. But as you get faster and you're able to draft faster and you're looking to spin a little bit more and do more um, production spinning to create a lot of yarn, then you will really start to notice the speed difference. And for me, I wanted to spin, you know, blankets, sweaters, that kind of thing. Um, so having some speed was a huge deal for me. The other thing is if you want to try out different drive options, um, the different drive options are double drive, scotch tension, and Irish tension. I have only own wheels and spun in double drive and scotch which is a single drive system um, which honestly if as you get good at spinning both of them will work for a wide range of things but just watch out because many single drive wheels cannot be converted easily or without additional parts and I know they're like oh the additional part is a hundred dollars two hundred dollars but when my wheel is only fifty dollars I don't want to spend another hundred dollars on top of all the other accessories I'm already getting to convert it to a double drive or a double treadle I'm not willing to make those kinds of modifications if I converted my single drive Ashford traditional into a double drive and added the flyer and added a double treadle I could have bought the Kromsky Symphony nearly to begin with like we're we're getting up there in the price range so um so just given my budget it actually ended up being much uh yeah so given my budget it ended up making way more sense for me to actually give up on continuing to add to and modify my first wheel the ashford traditional and just straight up purchase a wheel that had all the features i wanted now if you set out to buy a double drive wheel and you regret it most double drive wheels can convert to a scotch tension wheel. I actually don't think I've ever seen one that doesn't convert. So you always have that kind of as a back pocket option. Now I prefer to spin on a double drive for the single and ply on the scotch tension because I have more control over the take up and I could pack more. Um, if I have higher take up and it draws in the yarn really quickly, um, I have more control over how much I can pack onto the bobbin. And for that final stretch of pine that can be very valuable to me. So, the, you know, I do use both. So just kind of take into consideration what you would like to do there. In the end for me, when it came down to buying a wheel and paying full price, it really came down to the aesthetics, the style of the draw and the bobbin space and the cost, um, all of those things in balance. And in the end, it was down between the shocked Matchless, which is a beautiful wheel and very sturdy, and the Kromsky Symphony, which is a little bit more finicky, I think. Um, 
It doesn't feel quite as sturdy, but it has a huge old wheel and it's Saxony style and it's a beautiful wheel. And it is sturdy. I'm not saying that it's not, it's just that it doesn't travel well. And that's one of the features that kind of got cut um, because I knew that I wanted to do more long draw. And on my Ashford traditional, I had gotten really used to long draw. I knew that I loved to do the short or long backwards draw and spinning woolen or semi woolen. I knew that that would be a huge challenge for me to switch to a castle wheel, which I haven't ruled out, but for my main wheel, my daily wheel that I was going to spend all the time on, um, the Saxony was going to have to be it for me. And I couldn't afford the Shock Reese, which would be my other option. It is quite an expensive wheel. It is a beautiful wheel. I would love to, but I can't afford it. So in the end, it came down to choosing the wheel in my budget with the style I wanted and the accessories I wanted. And now I feel like I'm pretty, like similar to phones and computer systems, I feel like I'm really locked into the Kromsky ecosystem. Like if I got another wheel, it would probably be the Kromsky Sonata just because all the parts are compatible. So that's it for me today. I hope that this video was helpful to you and I wish you all the best and happy spinning and happy shopping. I wish you all the best in your wheel bag. So what do you think? I'd love to know what kind of wheel style appeals to you right now, what you think you'd like to try and what features are emerging as the ones that are most important to you. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts and please don't hesitate to comment with your thoughts or any questions you might have about the wheel shopping experience and I will try to reply and help you out as best as I can when time allows. I wish you all the best in your spinning endeavors and in your wheel shopping endeavors and I hope that this video was really helpful to you. Please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this. Thank you and I'll talk to you soon.